What's up, everyone? I'm David Warren, and welcome back to this week's video. Today, I have the honor of interviewing my assistant program director, Dr. Mike McKinnon, at National University Nurse Anesthesiology Program. I'm a second-year nurse anesthesia resident in the program, and today we're going to talk all about Dr. McKinnon's experience as a nurse, as a CRNA, and as a nurse practitioner. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. All right, Dr. McKinnon, we are live. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me today. Uh, before we dive into the questions, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background. Sure, Dave. I'll give you kind of a background on me. Uh, so I am Canadian. You'll hear it uh, every once in a while uh, in the A's and that kind of stuff. And I originally was a uh, EMT in Canada. And then I decided I wanted to do something else and went to nursing school, became an RN in Canada. It's a four-year degree there okay. and worked in the ER and a little bit of ICU. But I knew what I really wanted to do uh, was be a flight nurse. That was my that was my ultimate goal. And so I came to the U.S. looking specifically for a flight nurse job, worked a little ER and ICU in the States, and then worked as a flight nurse for a place called Aravac Services in Arizona for a number of years. And then... Decided I wanted to do the next thing after I'd done that for a long time. And that was an awesome experience and looked into a bunch of different things, including medical school and anesthesia, nurse practitioner, CRNA, all that kind of stuff. Uh, got all the way through the process of applying to medical school and then uh, discovered CRNAs at that point because I just never heard of them because uh, I'd never seen any, you know, it just didn't exist to me. And so that's how I decided to become a CRNA. Uh, went to anesthesia school in Philadelphia, also became an FMP after that. And um, once I went to uh, anesthesia school, I knew I wanted to do uh, full scope of practice, independent practice, came back to Arizona, been working independently ever since. And now I'm one of the owners, four owners in a 17 CRNA only group. Okay. And that's where I'm at now. I got you. So as far as your educational background, you got your EMT first, and that's kind of what got your interest in the like flight medicine, pre-hospital mm -hmm. arena and ER, and then kind of went to nursing school from there. How long did, did you say you were an EMT? So I only did that for about a year, year and a half. And I knew, I knew that there was nowhere to go there. You know, there was no like advancement. There was no next step. The great thing about nursing is that there was so many different options. You could work ER, ICU, flight, the or do telemedicine, all kinds of stuff. And so that's what led me to the to the nursing side. Okay. And then what really prompted the, you said you had like, you know, considered medical school and applied, and then you found out about CRNAs, kind of what prompted the switch to go the CRNA route? How did that come about? That's a great question. So I, you know, I never, I didn't have some dream to be a physician. It wasn't something that, you know, I'd always want, what I always wanted to be, but I had gotten to the point in nursing where I felt like I had hit the cap. The, the best it could get was being a flight nurse. You know, I was doing chest tubes. I was intubating people upside down in cars. I was putting in central lines. You know, I did pericardial synthesis. I mean, I did all the things, right? It was the coolest, most autonomous practice I'd ever had. And I knew I just wanted to do the next thing. And at that time in my life, I did not know what a CRNA was. And the only experience I had with NPs was basically online forums when I was sort of searching what to do the next thing. And basically the perception I got from basically detractors was that it was an assistant role, right? And I didn't want to be someone's assistant because here I was in a helicopter intubating people with pushing drugs, doing whatever I thought had to be done, you know, coding them all by myself with my paramedic partner without a problem. So uh, my I, I had eliminated nurse practitioner as an option because of that perception I had gotten on basically internet forms. And so that's that's how I ended up, uh, you know, planning on this whole med school thing because I just didn't know what else to do. Okay. So I did all the pre-med classes and did the MCAT and ended up getting on a wait list actually. And then that's right at that time was when I discovered uh, an anesthesia for CR as a CRNA, as a nurse anesthesiologist. And I'm like, this is it for me. All the cool stuff, all the autonomy, all of the fun procedures, and woo this was that, the thing. <laughs> so, all the worlds. Okay. Yeah, it got all the, it checked all the boxes for me. Yeah. Okay. So part of this interview, I really want to later on dive into the dual NP and CRNA route. But before we get there, we'll do some kind of kind of some more background questions. So, um, where did you go to nursing school? So I am from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. I uh, grew up in a place called 
Cape Breton Island. And I went to nursing school at a place called Dalhousie University, which is in Halifax, which is the capital of Nova Scotia. So that's where I went to nursing school. It's a four-year science degree there. Okay. And then four-year anesthesia training. How did you, you were on the East Coast, I believe you said, how did you decide, or how did you end up there versus somewhere maybe on the West Coast or, or wherever? Is that just kind of where you applied and got in or how did that work? You know, there's, there was not much in the way of information online about CRNA schools. It just didn't exist at that time. And we're talking um, almost 16 years ago. So it was a long time ago and there just wasn't anything there. And I didn't know where to go. And I had met online at that time who later became one of my primary mentors, a lady named Jan Menino, who was a CRNA in California who owned her own plastic surgery center. And the surgeons came there and she did all the anesthesia. She's a past president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology as well. Didn't know that at the time. Met her on a, on a website form and uh, she had invited me to come shadow her. And that's how I just kind of discovered that this was the thing I wanted to do in um, uh, Laguna Niguel in California. So this is clearly a nice place. And when, when I went there, yeah, it was really nice. She had a great house and her job was awesome. And I thought, this is amazing. This is the thing for me. I get to do all the things, you know, like I said, checked all the boxes. Yeah. And uh, I started looking into applications. She, she said, well, you know, I know some some different program directors and I know these schools. Why don't you try to apply there? And I'm going to write you a letter of recommendation, you know, and so I did. And that's how I ended up going to Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia uh, yeah. because she had written me a letter of recommendation and the program director felt that was a you know high praise and um, was probably a large part of the reason why I got accepted there. Okay. And you're also a nurse practitioner as well. So how did, I, we have a few questions to dive into with that. Um, I feel like it's not as common to see a nurse practitioner and a CRNA, the dual certification. What made you want to pursue both? And I guess kind of which did you pursue first? Yeah, I, I started off as a CRNA. Uh, so I became, a, you know, a CRNA and I did that for a number of years. And I decided um, I, I moved to this rural community where I am now, where we provide a lot of rural anesthesia services and an underserved community to, uh, you know, a lot a lot of patients up here. And one, some of the things that are missing was pain pain practice. And I decided I wanted to do some chronic pain, fluoroscopic guided transforaminals, epidural steroid injections, SI joints, all that kind of stuff. And uh, while I can do the actual injections as a CRNA in the state of Arizona, what was what was confounding was the fact that I could not actually um, do the diagnosing or write the H and P, the history and physical at that time. That was just how it was. I couldn't write any prescriptions because CRNAs in the state of Arizona really didn't need to. But uh, you know, I you couldn't in the state of Arizona, and so it was much. Uh, easier process for me to become an NP and get all of those things from becoming an MP. So that was the primary reason I became an MP. And then I also started doing a lot of uh, free care in the community uh, for people who needed, you know, didn't have access or, or needed some access. And so that's how I've maintained my nurse practitioner uh, certification. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, I guess kind of now kind of tell us about your current practice environment. You said you're in small community, rural Arizona. Um, what does your current practice look like? Do you incorporate both certifications? Do you primarily practice as CRNA or kind of, I guess, delve into your practice environment now? Yeah, so the practice that we have involves three hospitals and three surgery centers. So there's six facilities. And uh, there's between 16 and 18 of uh, 18 FTEs in total, all fee for service. So we bill for anesthesia services to insurance companies where we negotiate the contracts. We own the practice at every place. We're not employed by anybody. We're contract contracted to these facilities. Uh, and so, you know, the, our largest facility is about a 110 bed facility with a 12 bed ICU. We do everything from pediatrics to almost a thousand deliveries a year in OB. So lots of epidurals and C-sections with a uh, level two NICU there. And then, uh, oh, and PICU, or yeah, NICU. And then we do, um, you know, vascular. So we do fem 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 pops, triple A's, open and EVARs or endovascular triple A repairs. Uh, we also do like uh, thoracics. So we do you know, double lumen tubes for open thoracotomies and VATS cases and all that kind of stuff. So that was a, been the primary practice. I've been here for 11 years. Okay. So my primary practice has been anesthesia. And we've got a couple surgery centers, eye centers, and, uh, you know, actual surgery centers and one critical access 
facility that, you know, basically is a one OR place type thing that we rotate through. Okay. So we get a really nice range of practice. Um, so I do, I've done all that for a long time. Uh, and then when I uh, started doing the pain practice, I was doing it at the surgery center, uh, the private surgery center where I was doing fluoroscopic guided injections. And so I was using the NP um, between the two. And to give you some information, I guess, about my perceptions about the utility of also being an FMP, along with being a CRNA, you know, I would I would characterize the two differently in that. Uh, an, M an FMP, I'll be specific because that's what I am, an FMP, a family nurse practitioner, has a broad scope, but not super deep mm -hmm. from an, from like, a, you know, the uh, a depth of knowledge on every single topic. I think that's the nature of family practice, regardless of your initials. And then for anesthesia, the scope is a little bit more narrow, but it's extraordinarily deep in what you have to understand from each different disease process and perspective, how it relates to anesthesia. So the educational processes are different. And uh, the benefit of the FMP side being a CRNA is that I also got to learn about all the things that really maybe were not d directly important in anesthesia school, like, you know, the where someone is on the algorithmic process of hypertension management or diabetes or in their COPD. And when I see those drugs, I recognize, oh, this person's way down the road. I mean, this is not a mild case of, you know, hypertension or COPD. They're on three drugs, they're on this, they're on that. You know, they're taking rescue inhalers all the time. So I have, I think, a better understanding of the chronic management of disease processes because I'm an MP. Because that's what you learn. I mean, that's really what you're doing, right? You know, in 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 the FMP world, you do something, and three months later, you check back with them and see how they how it's working out. In the CRNA world, I do something, and if it's not it's not doing something in five minutes, I'm doing something new, right? Like that's it's a totally different perspective on on what you're really doing. But I believe that that you know the MP stuff has helped trigger and and key in on things related to their history um, that really kind of could impact your anesthetic. And so okay. there's a definite benefit there. That's how they overlap for me. Okay. That makes sense. And where did you do your MP training? So I did my training at University of Massachusetts uh, in Boston. And it was, uh, the didactics were mostly online. Uh, and then there was a skills lab that you had to go to on a couple of a, four or five occasions. And it was a post master certificate because I had already had my master's as a CRNA. And so I didn't have to do their master's classes. All I did was the actual FMP classes. So, uh, and the clinical time. And I did all my clinical in my local area. I mean, the benefit of being here for a long time is that I basically know all the providers, physicians, PAs, MPs in the area, and I could rotate with them easily. I'm just like, Hey, uh, you know, I got to do this much time. And you know, the things that people struggle with as an MP is that they have to set up their own clinicals. I did not struggle with that. I had people asking me to come because I knew them well, right? They were excited to have their buddy come. And, you know, so I got to do a ton of deliveries and OB with my, one of my best friends is an OBGYN. You know, I spent, so, uh, you know, weeks and weeks in the office with him doing all the GYN stuff. And so I was lucky in that, you know, I didn't have that hurdle that I think a lot of MPs run into. There was nothing I had to struggled to get a hold of. I had lots of opportunity, even got to do plastic surgery stuff and oh, OR stuff. And yeah, I got to be in the ER and I did all kinds of things. <laughs> so it was great. Yeah, it really comes down to who you know and, your, and the connections that you have. It's yeah. that way, I'm sure, in anesthesia as well, but really that way kind of across the board in healthcare, I feel like. Um, so you, whenever you went to CRNA school, you got your master's degree and you currently have a DNP degree. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us about that journey. Yeah, so when I finished uh, CRNA school and I had my master's degree, I think I said what 99.9% uh, .9 of people said, I'm done, this is it, I'm not going to do anything else. And then I I think it was probably five or six years later, once I was in this practice, I did the FMP thing. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's just a you know, post-master's, it'll be an easy transition. It didn't take very long to do it. I think I did it in a year and a half or two years or whatever it was, you know, because it was the clinicals that takes the most time. Uh, and then... Um, I thought, well, this is it. I'm done. And then I knew I loved education. I'd always been lecturing across the country. I did it as a flight nurse. I, you know, I did it as an ER nurse and um, I was doing it as a CRNA. And, you know, I 
I'd lectured at national and state conferences, been involved in advocacy on both levels. And I recognized that education was a lot of fun for me and I really enjoyed it. And so I knew that if I wanted to be involved in education in the future, I was going to have to have a doctorate. So um, when I recognized that was the case, I sat down and looked at what the options were. And, you know, you basically there's three options people look at, a PhD, a DMP, and, um, and uh, EDD. Those are really the ones that were the most common at the time. I didn't have a specific desire to, to generate original research and do, you know, uh, bench work. So I didn't, I didn't pursue the PhD or and the EDD at the time. I didn't think I was going to, you know, that was going to be my focus was only education. So I did the DMP um, at University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Roll Tide, because oh. I... Uh, that's right, man. Roll play. And and I did I chose there specifically because a number of my friends that were CRNAs had done their DMP there. And they found it to be very open as far as the kind of research you wanted to do. And I didn't want to do some fluffy BS stuff that I thought was a waste of my time and was just checking the box. And, and you know, in any doctorate degree, you can choose to do that, be it a PhD or be it an EDD or a DMP or a DNAP. Uh, contrary to what maybe some detractors would say, there's an easy way out in all these options and any other clinical doctor as well. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something that was meaningful. And so uh, I knew uh, UA was going to give me the opportunity to do that. And that's why I chose to go there. Okay. That kind of leads me into my next question, Ashley. So you're obviously my current assistant program director at National. So how did you, <laughs> yeah. how did you get into higher education? You had mentioned earlier, you kind of lectured and, and kind of got interested in that, but specifically for anesthesia, like how did you, how did you end up being an assistant program director? I think it goes back to the, uh, it's who you know, <laughs> and relationships you build. Yeah. And my involvement in uh, lecturing and, and advocacy across the country <clears throat> has given me the opportunity to meet all kinds of people. And one of those people that I got really involved with was a guy named Dr. Brian Toon, who started the national program uh, from its very inception. And Brian and I became great friends along with another CRNA named Scott Rigdon. And we all basically taught in a company together called CETU. And so we did ultrasound guided regional anesthesia lectures, pain lectures, and all kinds of other things, ran whole conferences, the whole thing. And uh, at one point, Brian was looking to trans transfer the program from a master's to a doctorate. And I just finished my DMP. And he asked me, he said, you know, you're just out. You, you Would you be interested in designing and developing some doctor courses for National University since we're, we're transitioning to this DNAP, a doctor of nurse anesthesiology practice, uh, you know, program because, it, you know, it's where everything's headed. And I said, sure. Having not developed a class before, I thought, I'll figure this out. And so I did. And I developed almost all of the doctor classes for national over a period of, uh, I don't know, about a year um, before the transition happened. And then he brought me on to teach as adjunct faculty. After about a year of teaching as adjunct faculty, the courses that I developed, he, there was an opening and they transitioned me to a full-time faculty. I did that for a year. Dr. Toon uh, eventually transitioned out of the program, moving on to other things. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Joe Martin, who was the assistant program at the time, took over and called me and asked me if I would step up to be the assistant program director since I had done so many things for the program at that point. And that's how I ended up there. <laughs> that makes sense. And I feel like it's rare to see, at least in my experience, it's rare to see somebody who's like a top-notch clinician and a top-notch educator kind of all packaged into one. Usually the people that are in education, you know, aren't really good at clinical practice and kind of vice versa. Um, so that's interesting that, because I feel like you're a top-notch clinician and a top-notch educator. And I feel like we need more people who are both, you know, who, who people who are teaching to know what they're doing every day in clinical practice versus someone sitting in, you know, the ivory tower. So uh, I think that's, that's accurate. The, you know, the problem with higher education in clinician, higher education is, has been that uh, the old saying that people can't do teach, <laughs> right. Yeah. And what has attracted people to education. And this is across the board, not just for CRNAs, you know, unfortunately, a lot of educators are people who see it as a retirement plan, right? Mm -hmm. They're not passionate about education, 
they just see it as, oh, yeah, I can do this and not take call weekends or holidays. And, yeah, I won't make as much money. But, hey, you know, it's easy. That's what they think going in. It's not easy, but that's what they assume. There are people who are in some other clinical transition in their lives and just can't do cl clinical education. You know, some people are those who have had maybe substance abuse issues in the past, but they can, they're still great CRNAs and can teach but they don't plan to stay. They're only gonna do that for that period and then they transition out of that. Um, and it's other people who think of it as a family friendly kind of job, you know? And then there's a portion of people who are just excited to be educators. Unfortunately, the, the, the paradigm shift has been slow in my career to get away from that brick and mortar, everything has to be sitting in class and someone talking at you for six straight hours and, you know, mm -hmm. ear murdering you basically, where you take away less than a half an hour of the information and end up having to learn it all on your own. Anyway, that's the nature of higher education in my entire career. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't want that to happen at national. And so what we wanted was to get the best clinicians who we knew were the best clinicians that were all independent CRNA practitioners in their own right, totally capable. And everyone is in our program who also had this love of teaching because, you know, to be honest, teaching doesn't pay, right? You know, I make 4X in clinical and from my business than I make from being the assistant program director at National. I mean, and it's W2 on top of that. So it's, it's like tax murder. So, so, you know, the money's not there from the education side. So if what you're looking to do is, is, is you know, kill it, you're not going to do that in education. Yeah. And so we created a... a, a a, na a natural program and COVID really poured gas on a fire that was already happening mm -hmm. uh, to transition to more online didactic and, and spend more time in person and lab and focus more on the clinical skills and the clinical decision-making and the critical thinking with the people who actually do it every day that are experts in their own field. I mean, everyone who's listening to this has had the ACLS or PALS or NRP instructor who clearly never once performed ACLS, PALS, or NRP. I've done all those things, right? And I've done them all because I've been the decider, the decision maker, the person who's involved in the process at all levels of that. And, uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a genuineness and a, and a, a, and it translates in teaching when you've actually done these things. And so that's what we pattern national after. It's been super successful for us, I think. Awesome. Um, so I kind of now want to move into some of the NP and CRNA questions. So surprisingly, I've, I've really had quite a few people reach out to me inquiring about being a nurse practitioner and a CRNA and people wanting to pursue both degrees and, you know, kind of the questions that come with that. So you'd mentioned earlier, I guess my main question is what types of opportunities are available for someone to utilize both certifications? So obviously doing the pain practice or doing chronic pain management in like rural communities, are there like other things that you can think of where someone could utilize both types of certifications? You know, I think a lot of this is going to depend on state laws. Um, so if I take that into the picture, right, what limitations a nurse practitioner or CRNA may have in one state or another, you know, versus another, that's something that, that can be very different, right? So for instance, in Arizona, I can't do an HMP as a CRNA, I can as an MP, but in other states, I can write prescriptions and do an HMP as a CRNA. So it, it depends, I'll caveat it with that on your state law. But in the bigger picture, what opportunities are there? Well, a lot of states, uh, for example, uh, in a lot of states, you might want to open a med spa. That might be something that you're interested in, or you might want to do uh, a ketamine clinic or IV infusion therapy or any of those kind of things. Those two really mesh together well, where some things you could do as a CRNA, like ketamine infusions, you might not be able to do as a nurse practitioner or as the medical director of a med spa as a nurse practitioner. In some, you know, some places, you it may be required that you're a nurse practitioner to be the medical director. A CRNA may not meet that role, uh, but within the facility, you know, there's the opportunity to work within the ICU and do real, you know, critical care stuff uh, as, a, as a combined MPCRNA. You're at a much uh, deeper level with critical care when you have both of those things. Um, you know, especially the CRNA side and critical care really, care really helps. So I think there's an opportunity. The question I think then for the viewers is, 
you know, is the opportunity worth the cost, which is the time of the additional training. If you're going from MP to CRNA, it is. I mean, there's there's no question. You know, you can you can forex what you make as a CRNA, as an MP, as a CRNA. To do it to do it the other way, am I making a lot of money as an MP? The answer is no. But what it did do is provide opportunity and additional skill set that is hard to quantify. And the cost to become an MP was relatively low in comparison to both my DMP and, and becoming a CRNA. It was cheap, really. The postmaster's FMP was not expensive, so. Uh, Dual roles are are difficult because how do you monetize them? You know, if you're if you're doing anesthesia in the OR and let's say the average CRNA gets paid 150 bucks an hour, that's just a, a blanket statement, not necessarily the average. And the average MP gets paid 60 an hour in the ICU, another blanket statement. Do they pay you $60 an hour when you go do your the work in the ICU and you get 150 in the OR? And is that worth it to you? You know, I mean, that's that's the question, because you're going to take a pay cut more than half in that in that particular example. And that's where it becomes an individual question. Yeah, I know that that really makes sense. And I feel like that that definitely is an individual question because there are I don't know there. I'm sure there are unique jobs out there for, you know, especially when you have contacts and, you know, people and you're in small rural communities, I'm sure opportunities would present themselves for uh, for both types of certifications. Um, you'd mentioned earlier about having dual certification and kind of, you know, doing either preoperative interviews or, you know, look, talking to a patient and realizing kind of the, I guess, the back end of the medical management of those patients and kind of how far they are along in their disease process. Uh, is there really a benefit to having an NP certification when you're a CRNA, and you had mentioned that example. Can you think of anything, any other types of examples of, of of how it might benefit you to be a CRNA if you're practicing an anesthesia as well? I would say if you're already a CRNA, the benefit of the benefits related to becoming an MP are are really kind of qualitative. It's difficult to like nail them down. It's like nailing water to a board, right? You know, it's fluid and it's difficult to say, well, this made a big difference. Like I wouldn't say that becoming an MP after being a CRNA changed my anesthesia practice and and you know made me safer or made made me have better decisions. But what it did was add some depth of insight, and I think that was a benefit. Uh, and then understanding that whole process in the back end was also a benefit. But did it did it change my practice as a CRNA? Not necessarily. Um, would an MP's practice change becoming a CRNA? Again, very different roles, so maybe not. And would you even practice as an MP after you became a CRNA from the other perspective? I don't know. Some maybe, some maybe not. Mm -hmm. It's just going to depend, especially when you're thinking about finances, right? Okay, that, no, that makes sense. Um, I guess another question I get from people trying to decide what route they want to go uh, is kind of, or if they want to do both certifications is which degree should they pursue first? Or does it really matter? Should they go to CRNA school first? Should you go to MP school first and then go back? Or is there really a, a rhyme or reason to doing one or the other first? I mean, assuming you're an RN and you're making that decision, um, I would say become a CRNA first. The, the financial benefit far outweighs um, that of an MP. And so you can pay for your MP program later in cash, as opposed to having to take more student loans. You go the other route, become an MP, you're going to be saving for years before you could pay in cash for a CRNA program and can't work at all. I mean, there's no process to work as a CRNA. It's very difficult. So when you're in CRNA school, whereas an MP, a lot of people do it kind of online part-time and then they do their clinicals around their 12 hour shifts as an RN. Uh, so that's not a possibility as a CRNA. Be very, it's very difficult. So, you know, if you want to get one done right away that has the greatest benefit, um, both financially and clinically, I'd go the CRNA route and then become an MP later, where it has less of an impact on you financially. Uh, that would be that'd be my advice if you start as an RN. Okay, that makes sense. And I guess a, another question I get is for the people who are trying to decide between the two professions, NP or CRNA, um, I, I guess for, for those people watching who may not be fully aware of what each profession is. Let's just briefly talk about each profession. So give us kind of a brief 30,000 foot overview of what a CRNA is and what a CRNA does. And, um, and then we'll do MP after that. 
Sure. So uh, a CRNA is basically the person who takes you the closest to dying and brings you back and controls the pain, both pre, post, and during uh, in the process. And that's really what CRNAs do is get you safely through uh, a surgery because, you know, surgeons are there to surgerize, right? They're not, they're not taking care of the patient in, in that way during the case. It is the CRNA who's doing all that work. And CRNAs work independently in every state in the nation. And so you have the opportunity to own your own practice. You have the opportunity to work as a W-2. You have the opportunity to work as a 1099 and save tax money and, and take home more money. Lots of opportunities within the nurse anesthesiology profession, um, both from a practice perspective, because you could work in a surgery center and Monday to Friday, nine to five, you could just do GI, you could work at a hospital, take call, do all the sick patients, do OB, everything else, do all the cool blocks. You know, I mean, as a CRNA, you're doing a ton of procedures, central lines, intubations, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, maybe pain practice you know, and all the OB stuff, epidurals, spinals for C-sections, all kinds of really cool stuff. It's a lot of fun to do and is really rewarding instantaneously as a CRNA because a you know, patient gets a total hip, I do a block, they get out, they're totally pain-free, they go home that day. Uh, I can see that immediately. Whereas I think it's a little different as a nurse practitioner. So I, I would say that's kind of one of the biggest things that uh, CRNAs, uh, when you look at the perspective, one of the biggest differences from my perspective anyway. Okay. Yeah. I, I would very much agree with that. Uh, it seem, it really seems like the best of both worlds as far as procedures and some medical management. Obviously, you have to, you have, to have profound knowledge of physiology and pharmacology to acutely manage the patient. And I think it's especially good for someone who obviously is an ICU nurse or is interested in critical care. Um, and I think there's some somewhat of an overlap between that and like a, an ICU nurse practitioner with some of the procedures and, and hemodynamic management of patients. So obviously the NP profession is quite a bit different depending on, I guess, what area you're working in, what practice environment you have, but just for like what you do. So, you know, some family practice on occasion, um, how does that, like, what does that look like as a nurse practitioner? Like what are kind of a, the same 30,000 foot overview of a nurse practitioner in that primary care type setting? I think that, the, you know, like if you're the person who wants immediate gratification, you're going to get that as a CRNA, right? If you're the person who wants connection, you're going to get that as a nurse practitioner. So I think one of my preceptors, uh, who was a, a really amazing family practice physician, who I have a lot of respect for, he was mine <laughs> uh, at the time before he retired, he put it to me this way. You get to see people's kids' kids grow up. And through that process, they become more than patients. I see people for five minutes, right, before surgery, and then they're asleep. And then I drop them off and pack you, sort of awake, a little awake, maybe still a little asleep. <laughs> and that's the last time I probably see them until the next time I see them in Walmart or in, in a surgery, right? Yeah. But as a nurse practitioner, you deal with patients, especially family nurse practitioners, throughout the lifespan. So you'll see someone, you know, as a teenager that gets married and has kids, assuming you stay in the same community and the same practice, and then you might take care of their kids, you know? There's a relationship benefit there that, I, that you know, I think there's a rewarding side of that. It becomes less about, you know, put the tube in, you know, manage the conditions, take care of the emergencies, and more about taking care of someone you really kind of get to know over time uh, and helping them become healthy, healthier people and, you know, live longer and higher quality lives. And, and the 30,000 foot perspective is that it is, it is helping people manage non-acute generally uh, situations as an FMP uh, over time to become healthier who you develop a real connection with as a patient if you have them long-term. And that's an opportunity you can't have in anesthesia. There's no long-term connection in mm -hmm. anesthesia. You might see them for seven surgeries over 10 years, but there's no connection in the same way, you know, as the person you see every month or two months or three months or for well men, well women visits and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it depends on, I think a lot of it is personality dependent. I mean, if you if you really want that time with patients, if you really value that time interacting with patients over a long period, you're not going to get that as a CRNA, but you are going to get that as a nurse practitioner. Uh, you know, and it, it's just different. If you really value that immediate um, benefit, you're not going to get that as a nurse practitioner. You know, you're going to get that as a CRNA, that immediate gratification. But as a nurse practitioner, you're going to get to see a process 
that is very rewarding where someone comes in and they're just so frustrated because they can't get their blood sugars or their, their, you know, hypertension under control. And you go through the process with them, which is an investigative diagnostic process. Again, something that is a little less common in anesthesia and, and make them better. And eventually you get them under control and they're so happy. I mean, there's a, there is a, a benefit to that from like a, a practitioner, you know, satisfaction, you know, that, that, that if that's important to you, you'll get that as a nurse practitioner. So I would say those are the two things. And that's of course, separating out money and work, uh, work, you know, life, lifestyle working. Cause you know, you're going to, you may work a lot more as a CRNA on call and stuff. And it's unlikely you'll do that as an FMP, but maybe as an ACMP. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, any regrets about having both certifications about going to CRNA school and then going to NP school or any, any regrets about any of it? No, not at all. I would do it all again. I will say this, you know, when I when I answered the question earlier about what you should do first, I would say definitely do the CRNA first if you're thinking of both, because it gets complicated for programs to evaluate an MP's experience when they come to apply to the program. If if you're working as an FMP, you're not going to qualify for the experience unless it's really recent. And that's going to cause an issue for some. You know, if you're an ACMP, well then we'll have to look at the experience and determine what you do and then you know, evaluate that. So from that perspective, it is better to do the CRNA first because it it doesn't impact your ability to get into the NP program if you're a CRNA, but the other way it could. Uh, But yeah, no, I have no regrets. I I would do it the same way I did it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, So for people trying to decide between the two, I've people that have reached out to me and asked me my perspective on that. I would just say shadow each profession obviously get to know what each profession does, the ins and outs, and then shadow, spend some time with a CRNA or spend some time with a nurse practitioner in those environments to see what you like. Any other pieces of advice you can think of about when somebody trying to decide kind of what they want to do? And obviously that depends on, you know, if somebody really loves critical care, that might steer them in an opposite direction of being a primary care MP. But for somebody in high school or early college who's really trying to, you know, figure out what they want to do, any words of advice for deciding between the two? You know, I think that it it comes, there's a lot of personality preference involved here. Uh, you know, uh, if you're, if you're into adrenaline type stuff, if you are excited when exciting things happen and you want to be involved in those exciting things, you're not going to get that as an MP. That's not the role, right? Uh, maybe in the ER, you get a little bit of that, but ER MPs are often doing urgent care stuff. So even then to a limited degree. As a CRNA, you can have all those things. So the benefit as a CRNA is you work totally independently. I've never worked with a physician anesthesiologist as my supervisor in my career. And, uh, you know, the benefit as a CRNA is that when something comes through the door at two in the morning, gunshot wounds, stabbings, massive trauma, whatever it is, I'm the one who's going to take care of it. And I'm going to do it because of my expertise and the ability to work the full scope of practice. The limitations just don't exist as a CRNA that can exist as an MP. And the excitingness, the exciting, the nature of excitement that comes with being a CRNA is I think greater uh, than what you can get as an MP in those roles because you are the primary decider. Again, the primary decider makes the decisions. And so that is an exciting role. If that is not something you wanna do, there is the option to not be that way as a CRNA, you know, and so it, it is all up to the individual's personality. For me, I am nobody's assistant and I'm never going to work that way. And I don't want to be that. And if that's the case, I wouldn't be where I was. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm an A-type personality. I want to make the decisions. I want to be responsible for the decisions I make. And I want to, you know, ultimately see the outcome of the decisions I make be positive. And that keeps you on the top of your game. And so so my perspective is, if you're into those kind of things, if what you want to be is the decider and you want to see things happen, you know, quickly and, and uh, you know, more instantaneous, I guess, then the CRNA route is the way to go. And that would be the choice I would suggest to make. You know, there's other things that you have to think about, like financial issues, financial concerns, what your goals are financially, because, you know, if you got to be swimming in the right direction, right? If, if your goal is, goals don't, don't dovetail with what an FMP makes every year, but does as a CRNA, although that shouldn't be the deciding factor, it's something you should consider, right? Because MPs still make a lot of money. So it's not like there's, they're, they're not doing well and there's not the opportunity to do even better as an MP there is. But 
it's something you have to consider. And the other thing is you have to consider where you want to live, right? Like if, if, if you're, if your goal in life is to live in a big city with a great downtown life, then you're unlikely to work independently in the same way as I do in a more smaller community. That's changing rapidly for both CRNAs and MPs, and it's changed rapidly in my career, but it's still true for the most part. You know, you want to work downtown San Diego, you're probably not going to be working in an unsupervised environment. And that's just the nature of how it is, you know, not that the outcomes are better, but that's just how it is. So yeah, those are things you also have to consider. Okay. And for somebody considering anesthesia, for me personally, I know I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into <laughs> when I started CRNA school. And I don't, I don't know that you can adequately, adequately explain that to somebody until you're like living it. Um, but what would you have to say for somebody who's like wanting to go to CRNA school? What does that journey uh, look like as far as intensity and rigor? You know, um, life ends day one of CR of your CRNA program. Like, don't expect to have your hobbies. Don't expect to spend lots of time with your kids. Uh, don't do silly things like plan to have a child during the program or plan to, you know, have a major life event occur during the program because there's just no time for that. You know, pre-plan and prepare your spouse for the nature of being an absent spouse for the better part of three, three and a half years, depending on the length of your program. And so, and that's just how it is because it is like drinking water from a fire hose and, and uh, you know, the rigor is significant and we lose, you know, we have attrition in our program and every CRNA program does. And because we're front loaded, it happens in the first four quarters, you know, when the science and all of those courses are the, the most volume, the deepest and the busiest at, you know, time of your life. And you're just not going to have time for all these other things. So you have to be prepared and plan for that. It's not, it's not going to nursing school where, you know, you're done at three and you're finished for the day and there's nothing else to do. That's just the nature of that educational process. It's not going in the clinical phase. It's not going, you know, to, to, you know, eight hour clinical days. It could be 24 hours. It could be 36 hours. It could be, you know, 10 hours, but it's rarely going to be short. That's just the nature of clinical in, in the clinical residency in a nurse anesthesiology program. You just don't have that additional free time like you would that's even scheduled out. It's just, there's no guarantees. And the time you spend in the didactic isn't half the time you spend studying on top of that later. So it's not like, yeah, your classes are all done that day at five o'clock and you're done for the day. You're gonna spend another half of your waking hours reviewing, studying, taking notes and internalizing the whys and critical thinking uh, related to the content in the evening and the weekends and the holidays and the weeks off. And so that's just the nature of the beast. And it really should be because, you know, CRNAs, as I mentioned earlier, bring people the closest to death they can get and back and control their pain. And that the expectation is safety, right? And CRNAs have a, a stellar safety, re safety record equivalent to every other anesthesia practitioner, including physicians. There is no difference in the outcomes or the processes or the skill set or you know the whole the whole process of anesthesia, regardless of your initials, and in order to be that person, to be the first profession to do anesthesia as a full time profession, dentists did it first, give them credit, but then they never did it again, <laughs> and CRNAs took over, right, and then physicians came in later, um, you know, so we are the first the first advanced practice role that existed, uh, and we are the only advanced practice role that that uh, builds the same as our physician counterparts. And so the expectation is that your outcomes and capability are equivalent, and that requires a rigorous program. And that's why the CRNA program is as hard as it is. I uh, agree with every word you've said. It has been, <laughs> uh, it, it is quite the challenge, but uh, very much worth it in the end. Um, that really yeah. wraps up all the questions I had for you today. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on the interview. Uh, any last parting words, anything you want to say to people watching? Yeah, you know, like uh, life is short, you know, decide what it is that you want to do, yeah. pick it and run down that road full steam ahead because ultimately this is the most rewarding career I've ever had. And I've done a lot of really cool things. I mean, I got to fly around a flight suit in a helicopter. I got to put in chest tubes on the side of the road. I got to do all the cool things. 
And there is nothing that compares to what I do today. Uh, that's both the educational side of it and the actual clinical side of it. It is an amazing profession. It is a ton of fun. But, you know, uh, as the as the Spider-Man's dad said, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and you have to be willing to take that responsibility if you want to be a nurse anesthesiologist. And that's just what it is. You know, yeah, you get paid a lot, but a lot comes with that. And like many professions, you know, a lot of the time it may not be terrifying, but you're not paid for the times when it's easy. You're paid for the depth, skill, and ability when things go wrong to manage those situations, just like every other job. You know, firefighters aren't paid when the call's not going out. It's the same kind of thing. And so you have to be willing to invest 100% to get that back, uh, all the benefits back of being a CRNA. But there is nothing better. There's, you know, that's absolutely the truth. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for today. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome, Dave. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you have any questions, comment below. Let me know what they are. I would be more than happy to either pass them along to Dr. McKinnon or to answer them myself. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.